And what I'm realizing now, it's so much more about first being in your body and connecting to what is in your present moment reality, connecting to your emotions, your root, the path of descension before the path of ascension. And I feel like so many of us, you know, with Instagram, TikTok, spirituality, we're like, I want to do all the fancy things. I want to astral project. I want to know all the, this information from the cosmos, but then we haven't mastered being here now. So can you share with us a little bit about the importance of first descending into the physical body before ascending and, and how it's actually not even possible to ascend if you're not first fully grounded? Yeah, for sure. Like, so there's this common misconception in like ascension theory, which is the whole point of it is to actually leave your body, which part of like everything's 50, 50, right? So you have to learn how to step outside of your body here and there, but it's kind of like a tug of war. Like you'll leave your body, you'll come back to your body. And then there's times where you're just getting to know your body. And a lot of times people think that the body is just gross matter. It's, it's dumb. It doesn't really retain any information. You can't talk to it, but science has shown us that like, for sure, like you can talk to your body, you can tell hey I love you you're amazing and your skin will get better like you'll start you know seeing yourself as more beautiful and people will start picking up on that as well so when it comes to like dissension um and usually too like people think dissension is a bad thing but really like when you're doing for instance like shadow work shadow work is a form of dissension like you're going deep down inside of yourself to understand what's kind of like in the background driving you to do the things that you do a lot of times when you're even doing like energy healing you have to like almost like backtrack a little bit in time to understand how it's creating your future. So like it's it, infinity is always coming back and that, you know, that, that loop that always comes back around. You have to understand that your true potential to access everything in the cosmos comes by integrating both of them in the now moment. And oftentimes people think like the now and the present are the same thing, but the now is beyond time. The now is just like, okay, what else is there other than time itself? Welcome back, Axel, to the Highest Self Podcast. It's so great to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. And the first question I'd love to ask you is what makes you your highest self? Uh, Openness, just being willing to dive into things that do not um, always make sense or may seem a little bit scary. You know, you have to be willing to say, I'm willing to dive into the unknown. And I think that makes you, that makes me the highest self. And I think it, it really translates across the board when we're talking about spirituality. Mm, yes. I really think the unknown it's hard because as humans, like with evolutionary psychology, like we have adapted to fear the unknown because the unknown is where I can get hurt, right? If I go into this dark cave, I don't know who's going to be in that cave. Or if I go into this jungle by myself, I don't know what animals are there. So like our human biology in a way has been conditioned to run away from the unknown. You know, I mean, look at 2020, it was so much uncertainty and that was like driving people insane. But also if we stick to what is known, I mean, imagine if we stuck to what we knew when we were 10 years old, you know, or when we were 20 years old or at any given age, we would never grow and expand from there. So it's like balancing that feeling of safety in your body and your nervous system, I feel, and moving into the unknown, which also requires you confronting your relationship with death, which I know is something you're massively yeah. passionate about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Death is like this huge thing that I think like, because, you know, in shamanism, you have to understand that death is part of like this Maya illusion thing. Like we are, a lot of people kind of had this experience where like, you know, a loved one has transitioned and somehow that loved one is still like communicating with you through like your dreams and stuff like that. Um, and it's just kind of like this, you have to understand that death is like a perpetual state. Like the moment you decide that you're gonna wake up one day, and you're not going to show up to your job anymore. You chose death over being the slave or the slave that you've been. If, if you've done it with a relationship where you're just like, okay, this is not for me anymore. It's this, is this interesting, um, illusion of like what we as humans have created this fear towards death especially again coming back to like the nervous system right like your body naturally has this like apprehension of like oh my god death is like the worst thing possible but if you if you think of death as transformation or the ability to like rebirth yourself recreate yourself reinvent yourself it's actually a blessing in disguise and I think that's like the hardest thing to learn mm. overall 
So true. So there's so much I want to chat with you about today. And we want to dive into connecting to spirit guides, angels, our, our support squad. But before we get into that, you know, something that I, I really feel, and I've known in my own journey, like when I first got into spirituality, I'm like, I want to know who all my spirit guides are. And I want to talk to my ancestors. And like, I want to know every single past life. And, and what I'm realizing now, it's so much more about first being in your body and connecting to what is in your present moment reality, connecting to your emotions, your root, the path of descension before the path of ascension. And I feel like so many of us, Mm -hmm. you know, with Instagram, TikTok, spirituality, we're like, I want to do all the fancy things. I want to astral project. I want to know all the, this information from the cosmos, but then we haven't mastered being here now. So can you share with us a little bit about the importance of first descending into the physical body before ascending and, and how it's actually not even possible to ascend if you're not first fully grounded? Yeah, for sure. Like, so there's this common misconception in like ascension theory, which is the whole point of it is to actually leave your body, which part of like, everything's 50, 50, right? So you have to learn how to step outside of your body here and there, but it's kind of like a tug of war. Like you'll leave your body, you'll come back to your body. And then there's times where you're just getting to know your body. And a lot of times people think that the body is just gross matter. It's, it's dumb. It doesn't really retain any information. You can't talk to it, but science has shown us that like, for sure, like you can talk to your body, you can tell hey I love you you're amazing and your skin will get better like you'll start you know seeing yourself as more beautiful and people will start picking up on that as well so when it comes to like dissension um and usually too like people think dissension is a bad thing but really like when you're doing for instance like shadow work shadow work is a form of dissension like you're going deep down inside of yourself to understand what's kind of like in the background driving you to do the things that you do a lot of times when you're even doing like energy healing you have to like almost like backtrack a little bit in time to understand how it's creating your future so like it's infinity is always coming back and that you know that that loop that always comes back around you have to understand that your true potential to access everything in the cosmos comes by integrating both of them in the now moment and oftentimes people think like the now and the present are the same thing but the now is beyond time the now is just like okay what else is there other than time itself Um, so like a lot of times, like it's through your own body, really. Like when you decide, okay, I'm not like you go to a, uh, a party and you know that the people at that party are people that don't resonate with you. And right before you end up getting to that party, you're feeling all this like weird vibration, like, oh, I don't want to be here or the anxiety or like, you know, you start feeling gross in your stomach, you want to vomit or something. That's all your body being intuitive and talking to you it's trying to tell you don't go here you know what kind of energy is here and a lot of times people will ignore that and then they wonder why is it that they can't tap into their intuition so they can channel their guides you know what i mean so it's like a a mix a mix of these two vital vibrations that will always make you more powerful when you recognize that we came to the spiritual realm to have an experience of being like super psychic beings that are able to manipulate matter at the end of the day with your mind right and like if you're always thinking that this is your cage this is your um this is like your prison this is something you have to escape from you're still running in this like illusion of yourself of saying like there's something better outside of this universe but i mean if you believe in god or the universe or whatever your your representation is it's everything right that's why we're told and we're taught oftentimes to like find the love in everything that you do. Cause then that gets you closer to source. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love that so much. And I think that sometimes we use these concepts as like spiritual entertainment, you know, it's like, we're like, I want to like know about the Pleiades and I want to know about like all the colors of my auras. And it's like, again, it's fun. I love doing that stuff too, but like, that's not where the real work is. Like the real work is you know, going into those edges, those dark corners, those, those feelings that bring up a lot for you that sometimes it's the last thing that you want to be in, but that's really where spiritual growth and progress comes from. And, you know, I understand that for so many people, they don't know how, or it feels really heavy. So I would love your tips on how we can start to maybe deepen into our shadows or these blind spots that we may be holding onto. So we can actually from, a more whole place step into doing the more outer body spiritual work. Yeah. So actually, I think, I think the best way to do it, honestly, is to pull up your horoscope details. 
Um, and I know it sounds kind of like lame at first because it seems like cosmic, but um, each, each, every person's uh, horoscope or like zodiac sign is tied to a specific angel. It's tied to a specific deity from any pantheon. It doesn't matter what it is. So first of all, you got to be open to the fact of like, if you have a hard set belief on like just, you know, that angels are the main vibration of the cosmos, you can also talk to like an Egyptian God. You can talk to a Greek God, you know, something like that. And what I like, what I, how I started doing it was I got on this huge rant and I was like, okay, well, this is my horoscope. I looked up my stuff and I said, okay, what are the deities and the angels that are connected to that? And you can go on Google and type in like uh, Zodiac gods. And you'll notice that if you're an Aries, you connect with the God of war, which is Aries. But also if you're looking at that same information under the Egyptian pantheon, you, if you're an Aries, you connect with Thoth. So here are some like angel, or, like some deities that you can automatically be like, okay, well, these are the beings that are, are based off of cosmic energies aligning themselves with me. Doing a little bit of research on those deities or those angels that you really connect with or are part of your horoscope will then give you interpretations as to your own characteristics, which then you have to work on in your body. So me being an Aries and Aries being the God of war that controls my zodiac sign, also thought being there. I, I pursue a lot of wisdom through thought. And I also have like a lot of that fire anger energy where I can be like super aggressive when I want something based off of that war vibration. So it, by studying those two deities, I can be like, okay, one of the things I got to keep in check is the whole fact that like, you know, I do have like a, this temper that randomly just surfaces, right. And can be like problematic, but also super beneficial at times. And then also looking at the vibrations of thought and being like, okay, well, I really pursue wisdom. I love wisdom and learning. And like, what is the thing, what are the things that make me feel like I'm nourishing my soul through that, like kind of similar vibration. When you start kind of just looking at those quick details, you can then start focusing more on the material world through those like uh, cosmic lessons that are vibrating through you. The same thing will happen with like Native American shamanism, like um, based off of my chart, I, I associate myself a lot with the falcon. The falcon is very strong, it has confidence. And you start noticing that if you're not embodying these things already physically, then you're not in an alignment with those higher beings, those higher energies that you want to start like really connecting with. So then you still have to sit down and be like, okay, well, where am I not feeling confident? Where am I not taking action where I know I should be taking action? And how can I become more of these cosmic vibrations incarnate? Because once you start really doing that, you start analyzing your characteristics, the actions you've done in your life and what you're planning on doing next, that's where the cosmos starts shifting. And then you start seeing all these like angel numbers. You start just seeing all the synchronicities come through and you feel like, You've, bec you've grown, not because you've grown in your body, but you've grown in your aura. Your aura is part of your body, but you've grown in your energy. Therefore, your whole entire universe has grown. Your consciousness has grown, and it's, come back in, it's coming back to your physical self. A lot of times, like when you do this type of work, too, you'll notice that there's a lot of resonating factors with, um, for instance, in, in my horoscope, um, I have a, the vibration of Autumn Raw, which is the, the vibration of being able to create things easily, but also the ability to destroy things. And I I've had to sit down looking at my charts and being like, okay, well, when I destroy things, why do I destroy it? Do I destroy it out, out of anger? Does it naturally happen the moment I think to myself, like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Even though I didn't ask the cosmos to like shift something, I just felt that feeling. And when you start taking like this mental registry and you start understanding how your body reacts to specific things. Like when you really want to get to know your body, you talk to it. Like one of the best things to do that I've taught my students is like get in a mirror, stand in front of the mirror and stand in front of it naked and just hear all the thoughts that come to your mind. If you start hearing, oh God, I have like a lot of fat on my ass or, oh man, like I could definitely like get Botox or you start hearing all these like negative narratives, you know automatically that that's what you're creating in your reality. So you have to then come back and be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, okay, you know, my, my, my fat on my body may not be kind of ideal right now, but you know what, it's who I am. And I'm going to accept that because if you can accept those like basic emotions, especially physically, when you're looking at yourself in the mirror, you get closer to accepting those other more difficult emotions that are in your ego, that are in your shadow. And then you can then sit down through your meditations and be like, you know what, I understand that, you know, maybe I had a fallout with like my sister and 
like all the details that played into that. And I accept my role in it. I accept their role in it. And I accept our role in it. Like your body is always going to be a representation of everything that's going on in your reality. That's why when you feel like, you know, you're not really wealthy, your legs feel really like tense and they, they shake and you almost feel like this constant anxiety that you got to keep running and you've never had a moment to just breathe because your body's taking your internal beliefs and it's turning it into like a physical like manifestation and that's what always happens in any form of energy work and any form of esoterica it's just like you are the cosmos embodied and like everything that you carry with yourself every belief that you have for yourself is going to somehow give you a response on that because this universe is just a huge mirror it's not really changing itself to cater to you it's changing because you're telling it to change at some subconscious level Mm. Mm -hmm. so so much there so first piece if we want to look up what deities are connected to our birth chart what do you recommend for doing that are there like any websites or if you just google it you'll find things i know in vedic astrology as well there are also gods and goddesses that represent the different signs too yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, uh, really, all you have to do is trust the universe, trust Google. And I just type in like, um, you know, it, it, gods and horoscopes, like horoscope gods or something like that. And then you'll start, it, usually it'll pull up all the um, Greek or Roman gods. But that's still a really good uh, starting point. You can look up um, Egyptian horoscope. Usually those horoscopes were built off of the gods so that you can understand understand and they'll tell you like multiple different kinds of gods as well i don't really have a specific website that i go to because a lot of what i do is just like channel the word but if you allow yourself and you trust that the universe is going to give you that information you just go on google and you you're playful with your words it might take you a minute or two but you'll start finding the information for sure i usually start off with like native american type stuff so i'll look up like um Native American totem animal. And most people don't think like your totem animal is your spirit guide, but it actually is. It has a lot of different information as to like what people resonate with you, what your life goals are, uh, what you should be focusing on. And you got to be open to exploring all the different pantheons. So like, it's okay for you to type in like, you know, Taino shamanism, zodiac or like uh, Hindu zodiac and stuff like that. So like Vedic zodiac. So you can go ahead and start getting different perspectives. And you'll notice that what the most important thing about it, I think by looking at all the different cultures that do it, is that you'll notice that they all came down to the same kind of conclusions on like your personality traits. But one of the things that you really got to understand is like, just because you're reading these things, they're a, like a, a basic blueprint to help you understand what's the next level and what you should be focusing on. But they're not the thing that you can use to like, you know, I oftentimes hear people say, oh, you know, well, I'm an Aries and I can't like, that's just my default. I just can't fix that. That's no, I'm sorry. Like you can't really say that at the end of the day, because you do have free will. You can change the things that are in your chart by being conscious, by working on yourself, you know? Yeah. And I feel like too, I mean, it would be a good fun project. I want to do this of like, look up every single system, astrological system, Mayan calendar, Chinese Zodiac, Zoroastrian system, um, Toltec, like Vedic side, other sidereal, the, the galactic, like there's just so many systems out there and like write them all down. Um, and then see what are the similarities that you're seeing? What are the differences? Like, for example, you know, in, for myself in Western astrology, I'm a Capricorn. So I'm assuming that's going, I don't know if you know what the deity is, but I'm assuming it's going to be a pretty like grounded one. Whereas in Vedic astrology, I'm a Sagittarius. So it's more of a Durga, more of a fiery energy in human design. I'm a projector. So that's more of an air energy. So someone might be like, well, that's earth and fire and air. Like that doesn't make sense, but it's like, well, you are all of them, you know, in some areas you have fire in some areas you have water in some areas you have this. And also too, I like to work with goddesses that have the energy that I don't have. Like I love to work with the the water element because I want more water in my life. I surround myself with water. I end up being friends with a lot of water people. So I think too, it's like harness your strengths and your gifts and call in what you are seeking more of to bring back that balance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I love what you said about like the elements, like oftentimes we think about like our Zodiac where I'm a fire sign and I can only be with fire people, but it's like too much fire will burn you out eventually. Right. So you got to be able to be like, okay, what are the opposite traits that I can surround myself with? 
like my significant other and I like he's a Pisces he's a water sign I'm a fire sign and because of that like we have like a really great balance because when I'm way too fire he has that flow that water to like just allow me to like see things from a different perspective and even like calm me down in different ways and we kind of like complement each other like that so it's really important to kind of like even take a registry from time to time don't be like a weirdo about it but like try to find out what your friends are like you know when it comes to like their zodiac just like the most basic stuff and it helps you understand why you're closer to certain signs certain energies versus others because they bring a certain something in your life I know for sure like I surround myself a lot with like rather water or fire people because the fire people really help me stay creative and motivated. The water people always challenge me to think outside of my normal spectrum, which is like, we gotta like win, right? Cause like I have that, that energy of winning. So it's very interesting when people are, are able to kind of just explore this because what I like to do too is like, I'll pull up a spreadsheet and I'll just keep uh like a, a sheet of everything that I've looked up and sometimes you you're gonna look up all the information and it won't make sense to you right there and then that's where patience comes in you have to be like okay I'm gonna explore this I'm gonna start looking for it in my life I'm gonna try to feel where I'm holding these kind of energies in my in my own body and by doing that you start seeing manifestations shift you start actually reprogramming your subconscious because you're shifting how you look at yourself ultimately Mm, I love that so much. So when working with deities, I would love for you to share, how can we know which ones we, we most resonate with are meant to work with? Like for myself, it's always been a certain one draws me for a certain period of time. Like I have my lifetime girls, like Lakshmi, Saraswati, they are my lifetime queens. And then I have certain energies that I'm like, okay, a little bit more Kuan Yin right now, a little bit more Durga right now, et cetera. So I would love for your advice on how do we know which deities we're meant to work with and, and for how long? Yeah. So like, it's just like hanging out with any friend. Like one of the things I really like to focus on is not putting them on a pedestal. Yes, you have to like understand their cosmic beings. They know more than you. You definitely don't want to disrespect them, but they're here to be your friend. And if you're coming from it, from this authentic space, you're not going to have a really negative experience. Like one great uh, example is Chinamasa. Like Chinamasa is one of those Hindu goddesses that she cuts off her own head and like her imagery is really like almost like violent and dark but when you start to hang out with her she's super down to earth like she's like a bullshit zero type person and like I you if you like those kind of vibrations or you understand that your friend is that kind of person then when she says something to you and she said you know what you got to stop hanging out with so and so you got to stop smoking cigarettes you got to stop doing this you know she's telling you that because it's the best most highest vibration that you need at that moment now the, the deities and the energies, they switch because they're cosmology energies. They're like natures of reality. So like, um, you know, this year is all about the energy of Mercury or Hermes, basically. It's the messenger energy traveling, like movement. Last year was all about Rahu and it was a lot about like um, Saturn energy, which Saturn is also another God, which is basically Hades. Um, and you end up, well, it's, debatable like Hades but um yeah you end up like kind of like seeing okay well if this whole entire year is ruled by this particular energy I can talk to that deity this whole year like I've been talking to Hermes all year long asking him what should I do where where should my focus be and you're not going to be talking to them all the time like you don't hang out with all your friends 24 7 like and you have to be okay with that because you, you need your time to grow so a lot of times you're going to be rather looking at the astrology and figuring it out I mean, it's easy to just find it on the internet or other times you'll have dreams. Like my hubs the other day, like, well, a month ago, he was like, he woke up and he literally said, have you ever heard the name Bhaglamuti? And I'm like, uh, where did that come from? He's like, I don't know. I was in this like dream and it, he described her dimension, which is like the turmeric ocean. And he was like, I don't know. She was talking to me and she said her name was Bhagavan Muti. And I, I was like, yeah, well, she's the Hindu goddess of like basically like stopping gossip and negative energy being spoken at you. And he was like mind blown because he didn't know anything about her, but she showed up and she was like, hey, what's up? Let's hang out, right? So you got to be open to those kinds of like vibrations, especially because they'll, they want to hang out with you if you're a conscious person and like, they'll show up rather through text, they'll show up through a friend. Um, and you can also choose who you want to hang out with. If you tell the cosmos, like, you know what, I really want to learn more about 
you know, manipulating time. I want to learn more about finding love or becoming a better mother. And you'll so you'll notice that if you want to become a better mother, out of nowhere, ISIS and Egyptian alchemy will start showing up. Or if you want to become better at bending time, Makahala is going to show up and he's going to want to hang out with you. So it's more so like this intuitive thing because they're all listening to you. Like sometimes we think about ascension as like the deities and all of them are like super high up, but really they're just like on the same playing field because there is no distance or time. They're just waiting for you to be willing to talk to them because they still abide to free will. So sometimes people are like, oh, what are my guides? But you weren't specific enough as to like what guides you want to talk to. They'll hang out with you for as long as they got to hang out with you. Um, Some of them have been with you for many, many lifetimes. And like when you start like doing like a a Kasha record channeling or like a channel my guides kind of reading like they'll show up first and those are usually the people that are like they roll with you all the time you probably have even been incarnated with them in specific lives um but other ones you just come through as an experience just to you know it's just like social networking and any any other level like you talk to somebody you get to know them you keep their contact if something comes up and you know you know that they're capable of taking care of it you're like hey you know i like i need a quick favor you know you gotta keep that like openness when you're doing your own energy work, because everything is energy, um, your own consciousness is going to always a lot like your own consciousness can be your own spirit guide. That's the other thing. Like, it's taken me years kind of like to sort of realize this, but your future self can be in a meditation right now, talking to the present self, which is the past to them. And they're guiding you to do X, Y, and Z to get to the next level. Like you are your own spirit guide we're all interconnected and it doesn't always have to be a deity or an angel that's talking to you to guide you. Mm, Yes. All of this. So, so important. So with deities um, and goddesses, I know for myself, like at the beginning, it started with certain ones. I would see like their statue or their image and something about them called me in like certain ones. I would just look at them and I'm like, I want, I want this energy in, in my life. And certain ones actually scared me. Like Kalima energy, Chinamasta energy. And it's funny you mentioned Chinamasta because she's actually in my Oracle card deck, a yogic path deck. And, you know, I was like, I don't know if people are going to want to pull Chinamasta. She has like, you know, blood, like heads, headless bodies with like blood gushing out of them. But like, she is also that important energy that kind of we're all going through right now of death and letting go and, and rebirth. So sometimes too, it's, it's energies that it may feel frightening at that time, but you can feel that you're moving through that. I know with ISIS energy as well, like so many high priestesses, people who resonate with that archetype, like ISIS is, is the goddess of that. So looking in, looking at images of different goddesses and gods and seeing what calls out to you, I think also like what they stand for, um, and certain lessons in your life, you can personify with them. Like you know, I love sacred sexuality. So Lalita Sundari, she is the goddess of that, that I will always have, you know, if I'm in a situation, I'm like, what would Lalita Sundari do? And I like use that as almost like a reflection of someone who's embodying completely that path. And the beauty of the goddesses is like, they're so kind of like single focus that like, Lalita Sundari can just be about sacred sexuality, but us as humans, we're so multidimensional. So it's like, we're able to pick and choose, okay, I'm going to use this energy in this area of my life and another energy in this area of my life and, and have that beautiful dance of like harnessing that archetype and stepping into that heart, that archetype without thinking that that is a person that knows better than us. It's like that fine balance of like, it's not like now it's like Lalita Sundari knows the answers and I don't, but it's like, how can I have more of her energy in my everyday life? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I also think about them as like coaches, you know, in a way, like, you know, I I don't know too much about this one subject matter. And just like in the material world, you technically would hire somebody to help you master those kind of skills. You can still have that kind of transaction with the deities or the angels or whatever you're talking to you. Like, you just be like, you know, I'm going to offer you a shrine just so that you can educate me until I learn the things that I want to, I want to learn. One of the things too, is like, um, not too long ago, they gave me a mantra, which is like so powerful. And it made so much sense where um, I was getting psychically attacked. And I have this thing where like, if you're psychically attacking me, because I know the amount of power I can do, like, I don't want to directly involve myself in that because it might be overkill. And then I was in this weird place. And then Kali came in and she was like, you know what? 
don't you have friends in the other world that you know back you up like let us take care of what you need to be taken care of and I said cool like I'm gonna sit back and I'm just gonna let you guys do it and they did it and I heard the mantra of like um my friends my friends always help me when I need it but when they need me I help them as well and like it's a two-way relationship like sometimes the deities come through and they want you to kind of like um they need your help in some way like not because they're like all they're ultimate divine beings that are limitless because they too are still learning specific things and sometimes they'll learn through your own experiences why it is that humans do a specific thing right why they hold themselves back from fully fulfilling themselves um a lot of times we think that they're all knowing beings but there's many times where you'll you'll talk to like a a god of war and what you really want to know is love and you'll ask this god of war this love question and they'll be like you know what you're asking the wrong person because they're only specified in that one particular subject matter so you had to be okay like kind of jumping around coming back to what you were talking about like those statues right there's been plenty of times where like i i've seen statues and i've been like they're scary some statues are definitely scary and you're like i don't know i should be diving into this but there's like this magnetic draw and like the the statues themselves have like they were created as a visual representation of the energy you're connecting with, but also it's a re- representation of like what you carry inside. Um, that's something that I've definitely learned a lot with hanging out with Makahala, which um, he's wrathful compassion. And like a lot of times we think of Kuan Yin as compassion in like loving mercy ways, but also Makahala can be like, you know, you know what? Like the most compassionate thing for me to do for you right now is to not give you give your bullshit space right like you have to be like really direct with that and sometimes you know you can be merciful through the Kuan Yin energy and help someone really grow but then other times by setting a boundary and being like you know what this is not okay if you want to continue being in my reality you got to look at what you're doing and that's having like a very stern compassion from the Makahala vibration that then can help a person be like whoa I gotta wake up like you know what I mean I'm about to lose something that's like really important to me whether it's a friendship or a relationship or whatever like it's one of those things that you really got to be open to and even if you have that fear and you feel the calling like just dabble do a little bit of research I never tell I I, I never recommend going to work with any deity or vibration without doing some research first like figure it out like read what as much as you can and then see why this energy is calling into your life like because if you can be if, if you can be aware of like why Sekhmet is showing up for you and you're like, okay, well, she's all about embodying your personal power, your own radiance, taking action. And then you're like, well, yeah, I've been actually kind of like stuck for a while and I don't really know which way to go. That's why she's showing up to you. That's why she's highlighting herself to you because you at a cosmic level are asking for help. And she's like, yo, I can help you through it. But you have to, first of all, like be conscious of who's, who's there and then invite them into your reality because just being conscious of them is not enough. Like you actually have to say like, all right, let's go hang out. Let's go chill because that's how they get to your house pretty much. Mm, Yes. And also reading about their stories is so helpful because the mythology is there to teach you lessons. Like the lesson of Sekhmet, it teaches you what happens when anger gets out of hand. You know, like yeah. she is that lioness and, and her anger and her rage is is her power. But then when it goes out of hand, she ends up like killing everyone that the that the god of or Ra had to basically then, I don't remember exactly, like basically had to like, kill her and stop her from destroying everyone else. And it just is the example of allow yourself to release your anger, but don't let the anger run you. So that's why it's so powerful. And I mean, especially in in so many of the goddesses, they are the same energy, but they transform into each other. It's like Durga, it's like, it's like a pantheon, right? She also is Lakshmi. Mm-hmm. She also is Saraswati. She, then she turns into Lalita Sinara. She turns into Parvati. She turns into Kali. Like they're not like different people in different points of time, but they're really energies that we're all simultaneously turning into and reading about their stories teaches you these like overall overarching lessons that can help us when we are feeling really fiery or feeling really emotional or feeling really creative. Like for example, in the Saraswati story, Saraswati is the goddess of creativity. And, you know, for so many musicians, artists, she, she is the goddess for them. And that's why I, I love her. However, in one of her stories, her husband basically left her because he was saying, 
it was, I think it was the embodiment of Vishnu was saying that you're not mother, uh, you're not like a wife material. You're not taking care of me. You're not taking care of the home. All you care about is your literature and your art and your music. So it's like, again, it's that lesson for like so many of us as women who are inspired to live our soul's purposes of like, sometimes the shadow aspect that we can experience is someone saying, well, you're not maternal enough. So yeah, like diving into their mythologies and their stories can really teach us so many lessons in our everyday lives as well. Yeah. And that's like coming back to like ascension, descension, like a lot of like a lot of times you'll work with a deity and it seems like they're testing you and things got really out of hand and you're like oh my god I don't know what's going on but it's only so that you can see past your own limits and past your own like limitations in general when it comes to like how you perceive your reality like I know I've hung out with a ton of deities that have put me in a really uncomfortable position and sometimes they give you a heads up they're like something's about like a lesson's about to show up just letting you know like, you better be ready for it other times it just catches you off guard and you're like in that moment like so uncomfortable and you have that opportunity to like step outside of your ego your normal framework your normal limitation to then ascend it seems like a dissension moment but only until you choose to like not let it make you go down again you know mm -hmm. exactly and it is that perpetual balance because if we're only you know there are some people who they think the entire world is just whatever is physical i am my body and that is it and there's nothing beyond so they could benefit from a little bit more of the air energy the angel realm you know things that are a little bit more cosmic and then there are some people who are just like plant medicine every weekend like always in the other realms, but they haven't mastered being here in their body. So it is, you know, the universe is in a spiral, like every single thing in this world. If you look at even a plant, it's always spiraling and spiraling and spiraling. And really it's that lesson of we're never done with anything. It's going up, it's going down. And we're always going to come back around from a deeper and deeper and deeper understanding that you may have a certain time period with the deities. And then you may like kind of just go into meditation and then you may come back and then you're into the angels and then you kind of just like go into this other, this other realm. And I think so many of us were so used to like the Western school system of like, you need to stick to one thing. And like, that is the only one thing. And if you bounce away from that, you're a failure. It's like, no, your, your higher self, your, your soul is really guiding you towards what lessons and what realms and dimensions you need to experience. And then when those soul contracts are complete and it's important for us to now learn from these other realms and perspectives that will take us to the next you know spiral of growth that we're in yeah no definitely i you know the way the way too that you can look at it is for instance if you look at like sekhmet and then you look at kali both of them are like pretty intense vibrations but they kind of sort of bring you back to the same concept from two different levels of understanding so it's like it's okay if you're if you're wanting to learn like power or something like that and you jump through different deities that will teach you power because ultimately they're all cohesively coming back to give you perspectives that you wouldn't learn with one versus the other. Um, another thing that's really powerful with that kind of like self mastery is like a lot of times people will go ahead and they'll try to take a ton of psychedelics and they think that the only way to access the other realms is through those psychedelics. When in shamanism, what we learn is like, you take psychedelics to learn the vibration and integrate it into your body. And a really, really powerful shaman is a, is a kind of person that like you're in their presence and you can just feel their, their lucidity. Like they're in a different realm, even though it seems like they're still standing with us. Right. So you have to allow yourself not to always just like piggyback and depend on a specific practice, not even meditation or, you know, there's even mantras, right? Like you can chant mantras over and over and over and over and over again, like, like cream, for instance. But if you're always just chanting the mantra and you're never like integrating it into your body, that's what they were made for. They were made for you to be an embodiment of divinity. And it, we are like a like almost like a soup of all the deities, all the vibrations in the cosmos. And they're just waiting to surface through us rather through an experience or through something else. Like I've definitely learned that like with my career where um, there came a point where I was just kind of like, okay, well, I want to hit the next stage because I won't have to deal with a lot of the drama at this lower stage that I thought I was dealing with. And then when I ascended, right, quote unquote, from one step, one level to the next, 
I noticed that like the same patterns were still there. They just changed their forms. They weren't that intense. And I had to learn like a different format of what I was dealing with before. So I can get even better at like, you know, doing what I do on a daily basis. So a lot of times there's like this escapism vibration when it comes to like Ascension, even where, you know, like you're always relying on something else to almost like come through and save you. But a lot of times when you really become really good friends with these vibrations, they'll put you in positions to test you on your own willpower. Like we're not always going to be there to save you. Like this is your life that you have to experience. We're here to teach you help you embody and make it easier, but we're not here to like do the heavy lifting for you. You're the one that decided to come to the third dimension and have that experience to learn polarity. And a lot of times people are like, oh, well, you know, looking at Chinamasa, she's like really intense. Like she must be evil. It's a natural human perception to see her images and be like, oh, you know, like, whoa, I don't want to be involved in that. But then when you take the time to get to know her, to get to learn her, you end up realizing, wow, like, this is one of the most beneficial things that could have happened to me to grow and become more of who I was supposed to be it's like they're all part of your greater soul purpose at the end of the day Mm, so true so now moving into spirit guides so many of us we are seeking to work with spirit guides but we're stuck because we don't know who they are so first of all how important is it to know who they are specifically do you think they are like certain certain maybe people or archetypes, or do you think it's more our ego putting on a face and a name around energy? Yeah. So that one's one that like the Egyptian God Doth had taught me. He was like, you know, I'm, if we're all interconnected, I'm just another version of you that has acquired all this information that you don't currently perceive. And I was like, well, that was kind of like mind blowing. Um, but yeah, when you're connecting with them, like you don't really, they're like informations, right? So like, if you can embody the, the vibration of Kates, which is basically pleasure, if you're finding pleasure in your life, that the, just the vibration of pleasure is ascension and will lead you to certain places. Every vibration has a dissension ascension vibration that we were talking about, which, you know, you can take pleasure and really make it toxic but you don't necessarily always have to know their names. And I think a lot of times people get stuck and they feel like they can't move forward because they can't see them, they can't hear them, they can't feel them. All you have to know is that they're there, right? And then be willing to take steps into the unknown and just be like, okay, show me what is going on. Like, show me what I need to do next. A lot of times my my spirit guides, I just hear voices. Like somebody will chime in I think I have like hundreds of thousands of them and they'll just like show in and be like hey you need to do this right here I don't always know who's saying that I just know it came from a higher vibration um that is obviously trying to guide me to the next level and I'm just like I might as well just listen that's the point of it like you could ultimately say that every spirit guide deity angel everything is just another echo of source which is just another echo of you and who's to say that sometimes you hear a voice or like a prompt, a gut feeling, and that's not just source transmitting itself through you. A lot of times people even think that source is so far beyond them that they have to connect with the spirit guides first. And it's just like, no, you can choose your experience. Like this is like a la carte almost. Like you can choose to become, you know, really well versed with a bunch of angels. But I really do recommend that you understand that angels are part of a greater vibration, which is called demons, right? So that means demons also fall under that category. So demons and angels are demons and they just have different philosophies on life. And automatically people will see like the word demon and be like, oh, negativity. Not all demons are negative. You know, some demons are are actually really well intertwined with other gods and deities that have existed before. Like a great example is Baal. He was the Canaanite god of like uh, wind and uh, like harvesting and the sun and stuff like that. And when the Canaanites basically started fading out, Baal got turned into a demon of pestilence and also a demon of cure. So it's like there's there's that double vibration. Amon in uh, Egyptian vibrations as well he was the god of secrets of the unknown of like your unconscious mind and as like christianity started stepping in he got turned into a demon so you have to be willing to even just allow them to teach you who they really are 
And sometimes that's just going to come through as like this random instinct. Like you got to buy this one book about, you know, Egyptian gods and like you start messing around with tarot. There's, I think tarot has been probably one of the best ways to really connect with specific deities. Um, there's two uh, tarot decks that I really love. It's like the goddess and sirens and the um, gods and titans. And they have so many different kind of um, gods and goddesses in that where you shuffle the deck and one day you just pull out, you know, freaking Apollo and you get to embody his vibration, which could be, you know, like um, luminescence or becoming very determined towards a specific vibration. Like a lot of times it's just synchronicity too, because you'll ask for an answer and you'll be like, okay, should I, should I quit my job? And you look at the clock and it's like 1144. That's technically a spirit guide talking to you. You didn't have to know his name or whatever. It talked to you through the numerology and numerology, geometry, mathematics, all of that is a spirit guide as well. You can't just, just put it into like this position of a physical body because we are the mathematics that creates the rest of the cosmos. There's no separation between us. Mm, so true. Yeah. I feel that it's, it's all energy and our human minds cannot compute energy if we do not have personification around it. And really like even deities, like that ultimately is why they have names and statues and stories. It's so like we humans can grasp these energetic lessons. So what can be helpful to just trust that there is a higher power that is supporting you and, and cares for your highest good is to begin, um, journaling and practice some automatic writing and write down, you know, I meditate. I'd like to connect to my spirit guides, those who support me, those who are here for me. And then you can start writing, what is your name? And then just let your hand, sometimes you could use your other hand that allows you to be a little bit more receptive and see if your hand starts to like come up with a name. I know for myself, it, it did now looking back on it, I think it was like my own highest self writing a name. So I would believe it. Like now I don't hold on to spirit guides as much as like, I have my spirit guide, which is like this Indian man. And from this time, it's more like I, ha I have support. And I know when I make a decision, I know when I'm guided somewhere else, I know I have the support, but what helped me now trust that and not question it is to have this personification, this practice of like, who's my spirit guide? Like, where are they from? What are their names? Like, what do they look like? Because that just helps you build a relationship with the unknown. And then eventually what happens is you don't really need to hold on to the identification as much because you're just like, truthfully, it's beyond my human understanding. So I'm just going to just trust that it is. Yeah. 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 And that's like kind of like the divine force of movement that goes to the cosmos. It's like what you're pretty much going over for sure. One of the things I think is like really important too, is like the whole perception of non-attachment that you know like is in buddhism like attachment is the root of all suffering and a lot of times like when we're like oh i got this one guy and like this is my ride or die which is like okay like, you could have that person but if you're constantly just attached to that person you're going to notice that eventually you'll get cut off from them because they don't they don't have that level of attachment either like a lot of the deities and stuff like that they are like polyamorous they're like they're willing to explore not being like almost like shackled to any one situation so you have to be willing to say okay like for an extended amount of time I worked with this person or, or this energy because sometimes they also shift themselves like you'll start working with a specific vibration and it showed up as a person or a being that you could talk to and then out of nowhere that that energy kind of like disappears but it's still in your aura and it starts showing up as like life's lessons it starts showing up as conversations it starts showing up as like dreams that you're having that you're still in the vibration of that deity and that deity is still in you but you have to remember like the like just like Gaia right we look at Gaia Gaia is not only the celestial planet that we live on which is an extension of our body she's also a spirit that you can talk to ultimately you're always talking to the spirit guide which is Gaia if you just go out into nature and you allow your mind to clear out and connect with nature it doesn't have to be super complicated it's just you're eventually you end up learning these different perceptions that will then teach you how to become more of yourself definitely like with like automatic writing i think that's one of the best things that you can do is like you start like asking a question like 
who is my spirit guide? And you might not get an answer. So it, a lot of times people are like, oh, this doesn't work. The moment they don't get an answer. So you have to be like, okay, let me change it. Like, um, what do my spirit guides want me to know right now? And they'll might just give you like one word, like love. Okay, okay, well, love. What does, what does this word love mean to me? And you almost like create like a tree map that is basically all these word associations. And that's you channeling maybe one or multiple different deities that are talking to you at the same time. And another thing that you need to understand is like even your past lifetimes um, has to be like, they're like spirit guides as well, because, you know, if you lived in a lifetime that is associated to like Atlantis, for instance, then you, you'll notice that a lot of the things that happen in the Atlantis story are replaying now. So like your past lifetime that experienced all those things back then is coming through right now again and reminding you like, hey, this one pattern, this is how you defeat this one pattern by practicing meditation. Sometimes you're doing yoga and like you just have a revelation in general and that revelation is just pure energy. And a, and a lot of Egyptian alchemy, um, there's this reference towards the, the waters of chaos or like infinities. And I think that's what's really powerful is like you can never define infinity. Therefore, you can never define anything in the cosmos for what it really is. Like it's always going to be continuously expanding, growing and changing from your current perspective. So you have to be willing to dive into the unknown of those other perspectives. You have to be willing to even be wrong and say, like, what if, you know, everything that I've been working with, everything that I know, everything that I've gotten accustomed to isn't the full spectrum of what is infinity. And when you start really considering that you're like it can't be because infinity is infinite like if infinity is eternal you cannot define it that's why it doesn't have a, a specific calculation to it so what is that and I think that's where the ego really starts to kick in and be like no you got to work with this one deity no you can't step out of like you know just working um in the light spectrum for instance and that's where you can fall into like a common term where people um today call it like the false light right like the false light is essentially just your ego telling you this is your limit, right? And that like when you believe that limit in any way, shape or form, like rather it's good or bad to be one way versus another, that's where you're like creating a holographic reality that is going to always supply a limitation at the end of the day, especially when you want to step out of it and grow. Like you have to be willing to say like your ego knows about a specific kind of reality. Maybe you're a chef there's a part of your ego that knows a lot about cooking, but there's another part of you that is, is well versed in tarot and you've never been able to explore that because you've subscribed to the chef identity. And a lot of the deities will even show you that like through the work that you do with them is like, they don't even subscribe to their personalities. Um, the, the goddess Isis is really powerful to teach you that she says like, you're, you're a being of 10,000 names. Like, your name ultimately doesn't matter. It's the vibration behind what embodies each one of those names. And today you have to even look at your own personality and say, okay, like Excel, you know, is just so much of what I understand myself to be this lifetime. Like, who am I if my name is no longer Excel, right? And who am I if like Excel can't subscribe to the story that he's lived in? Like, you, that's where power really comes from. That's where ascension truly lies. It's that mm. uncomfortability. Absolutely. Yeah. Imagine if you just didn't have any of your stories and you were just placed into this reality right now, who would you be? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's just like, is this weird? <laughs> is this I know when like I go into it, I'm like, <laughs> but one thing just to, to bring it back for people just starting on this journey, what really helped me when I first started of like, what are my past lives? Do I have spirit guides? I remember I was like 20 years old. I was in the study abroad in Paris and I had no friends there. It was completely by myself. So I had all this time just like by myself to think and contemplate. So I started to write down what are the historical time periods that like really resonate with me? Like when I think about them, I feel like I was there. I love them. What are the languages? What are the cultures? What are the archetypes? What are like the types of people? So I started to write down, like, I love like indigenous medicine woman, like something about them. I just, I just feel a connection, uh, an African young girl in a village. Who's like dancing to the drums with a big smile. I feel a connection to that Hawaiian culture. There's something in me with that. So I just started to write them down. And that really created my first connection of like, 
there's some, there's something here. There's also certain time periods and archetypes. I really have a rejection towards like, for me, it's the going to like the South, seeing plantations. Like I get the heebie-jeebies because I have been a slave in many different lifetimes. Like, or I grew up in Boston and seeing all the colonial buildings there. I'm just like, something shit hit the fan here. Like, get me out. That's why I I left as as soon as I could. So like, also there has been trauma in certain lifetimes, you know, the, the witch hunt wound, et cetera. And, and then when I started to move into my spirit guides, they really are a reflection of those lifetimes, like the indigenous medicine woman, the, the African dancer, um, and certain, certain ones, I feel a greater pull to in certain time periods of my life. When I was writing the books on Ayurveda, very deeply connected to the lifetime that I was an Indian um, Rishi man in Northern India. I actually had this dream once that I was flying over India and something pointed to me. It was like, I was flying over a map of India and it was like, this is where you're from. This, the Sarasvati river. And I was like, Sarasvati river. I woke up and, and this was like way before I even knew any of this stuff. And I Googled it and I found out that that was a river that dried up like thousands of years ago. It doesn't even exist right now. And it was where the original, you know, Vedas were, were written. So I know like that was proof to me. It showed me that I was there. So for me, it's like kind of one in the same, my spirit guides, my past lives, the goddesses, they all come from these similar energies, archetypes, historical time periods that I feel most resonant with that I know I, I still have karma to play out in this lifetime. For me, Lemuria, like that is such a huge mission of mine to bring that Lemurian frequency, to bring heaven on earth. And I literally had to play out an exact situation of, of how I died in Lemuria in this lifetime, again, with, with someone who was very Atlantean. And I even remember the Atlantean lifetime, but like, I didn't have a good time in Atlanta. So you're super Atlantean. I'm super Lemurian. It's, it's so funny. Cause you're all yeah. like in the science and technology. So I share this all because it doesn't mean you have to sit and wait for your dreams to tell you this, but it just comes from writing down. Okay. What are the time periods? What are the historical figures, et cetera, that I feel most resonant with. And then from there, it will kind of show you like what's next, what, what's next. Can I read a book about it? Can I start listening to music? Like because of my Lemurian lifetime, which I still probably feel the most connected to out of all my lifetimes. I went to mermaid school. Like I live by the ocean. Like I live my life thinking, how can I bring the Lemurian frequency to earth as my North star? So it starts with just having this feeling of like, I connect to fairies or I connect to dragons or whatever it is. And then letting that guide you towards what's next. Oh, totally. Oh, totally. Like, and what's crazy is when you end up sitting down and you you think about because like, hindsight's 2020 20, right so like once you have the level of consciousness where we're at right now you look back on your life and you're like oh damn like I've always known who I am I just kind of like forgot who I was you know and you you've been doing the same things over and over again I know definitely when I was a little kid um I used to be super obsessed with mermaids and like all of my classmates hated me because you know it, it was just like I always had to create a project around mermaids and then same fast forward you know <laughs> yeah fast forward 20 years you know it's like, oh damn, I lived in Atlantis. That makes a lot of sense. Like the water energy and like, who knows, like the the mermaids probably were an actual species of people at some point. And then you end up reading about like Sirius A and Sirius B. Sirius B is a lot of like that water energy. Like mermaids live there and you start kind of like realizing that, wow, like you have like this, you've always known, you just haven't known, you haven't been aware of it. Uh, I know when I was a kid, I was drawing a lot of like, Um, star of david's which in alchemy means like the balancing of all elements and it also means the ether so like nowadays like being an alchemist that's been able to study all this stuff in shamanism i'm like oh duh when i was like a kid and i used to be in in church or some place that made me feel uncomfortable i was drawing this symbol to stay balanced and stay grounded in my own power and i didn't even know what i was doing you know so it's like this really interesting thing especially too like if you feel like this draw to go to a specific place um not too long ago my hubs and I we went to um Provincetown and being from New England myself you know um I've always had this even as a kid I had this like really huge draw to like the Native American culture that's like all around there and I when we went to Provincetown we went into this one um 
like pilgrim museum that's there and being there i was having flashbacks of like oh this is why i you know i i don't really like the pilgrims and this is why i don't celebrate thanksgiving in a specific way or you know for me it's always been like i'm i'm celebrating my ancestors not the people who migrated here because there's so much almost like it was a, a really huge awakening that like okay the reason why I'm so huge into Native American shamanism is because I've lived that life before and the reason why I've had these traumas especially living in the New England area and a lot of like the trials and tribulations that you experience living in Boston or or certain places is because like I was almost like attached to the story of like my land being taken away from me and like you reincarnated in those places almost hoping to make a difference and that's the karma like you have to sit down with yourself and be like why did I get so attached to this why am I coming here and a lot of people will go to like Egypt and then all of a sudden have like an epiphany as like what they have to do and change their life to become happier and that's just like the, the, the generalized energy of history infinity and basically I guess your spirit guides if you really want to count it as that but a lot of times you don't even need that to be like in your own power Mm, yeah when I was a kid I was always drawing yin yangs yin yang and it's like the balance of the feminine and masculine energy like that was my thing and then also roses and like the, the rose lineage is the divine feminine high priestess goddess lineage of the sex rituals from goddess Isis who trained Mary Magdalene and like the entire temple of the rose and like the Venusian lineage which I, I feel such a resonant with today but as a kid I was just like I don't know I I love roses. I'm just going to keep drawing that. So it's like these codes are within us and go back to what were the, maybe the characters, the symbols that used to naturally draw as a kid. And what could that mean for your life today? I also think like that location alchemy is so important. And where were you born? Because our souls chose to be born in that place for a reason. So yeah, both of our souls chose to be, were you born in Massachusetts? Yeah, I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, grew up yeah. in Boston. So yeah, guess, so like, we both yeah. chose to be born in, in Massachusetts. And yes, that Wampanoag, that Native American culture, same. I like have never celebrated Thanksgiving. Like since I was a kid, I'm like, this is wrong. This is the atrocity. And, you know, just feeling such a deep connection to the Native Americans, to the Salem witch trials, to like just all of the historical things that took place when, you know, Massachusetts is the first place that the pilgrims came that we had some, you know, unfinished business, some karma. So look at the place that you were born because it's not an accident. Also look at certain locations that you may feel drawn to go to because there may be some codes there for you. Like, I mean, astro, astro cartography is a huge thing. If you look up your birth chart online, if you look up astro cartography, you can actually see, see all these different lines, your Venus line, uh, Pluto line. And it says what places around the world carry significant energy for you. But for me, you know, India, obviously huge one. Like the moment I got the opportunity to go to India, I am like, I am there. This is, this is me. But then from India, it was Bali. Like I did not know why I never met anyone in my life that went to Bali. I just knew that I needed to go and meet going to Bali is when I really let go of all of the conceptions of who I was and like rewrote and reprogrammed my entire state of being. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't come back to the womb space that is Bali. So certain places that really draw you, like each land carries its own energetic frequency, like the land there, the nature there carries such potent medicine. And that's like the thing that concerns me with all this like metaverse virtual reality stuff people are like you're never going to need to travel again because you could just go to the pyramids of giza on vr i'm like it doesn't have the energy like i can be in a waterfall in vr but it's not going to have the energy of the waterfall of being there in, in person and i think you know, travel has really slowed down for so many of us and has become really difficult. But like, if there is that one place for anyone listening to this, of like, I've always felt drawn to go to Morocco or Iceland or Machu Picchu, whatever it is, there is something that your soul needs to learn that it can only learn through being there. So like, try to do whatever it takes to go there because that will teach you the next step of where you're meant to go. Absolutely. Totally. Well, okay. Like astrocartography is a great example of like, like cosmic free will, because 
you get to see like what lines will be better for business, for like self-development, for romance. And depending on where you're at in your life, you're like, okay, well, I want to work more on my business. You would want to just look at those lines, right? You choose, you with your free will, you're choosing to be in that certain vibration. A lot of those lines are associated to the planet. So like, let's say that you go closer to your sun line and that's more so for like spiritual development through that, through the sun vibration, you can still connect with like a lot of deities that are associated to that particular cosmic body like each cosmic body has a set of deities that work with them like if you've always been drawn like I've always been drawn to the sun so like a lot of the things that I do is I look up like you know Apollo raw like anything that's like like sun fire base if you're if you've been always drawn towards like Saturn you can look up your guides and still have that energy too and then you'll be able to see like how those those life lessons on your archer cartography and those particular deities will even present themselves in that one location. The other thing too that yeah, I've noticed with like astro cartography and those like specific locational alchemies, it's like some of them make you feel uncomfortable even before you decide to like go on your trip that way. And you should still go even if you feel like some sort of like terror or something because you're almost like telling your body it's okay this lifetime like we yeah we went to some shit last time but now things are different like we don't have to be like carrying that everywhere and it's almost like a purge from your energy like I, when I went to Aruba I went to the top of this like volcano and I didn't know why I was so obsessed I was like you know what I will skip so many different things with so many different people that I'm supposed to be hanging out with here just to go to this volcano when I got to the very top of it like I had a few revelations and like it was just, it was really interesting just how it all came together because I was like, oh, I've lived in Aruba before. I've lived somewhere around here, you know, and you end up even through the astrocartography, you'll see like how you've had multiple lifetimes. Like on mine, um, Puerto Rico is one of the places that I'm supposed to go to. I'm freaking Puerto Rican, you know what I mean? Like, so then Egypt, like um, freaking Cairo is another place that I'm supposed to go to. And Cairo is where I used to rule when I was a Pharaoh back then. So it's like all these different things where you, you go to, I got drawn one time to go to the Anastasi city. Uh, I think it's in Utah or in Colorado and like paying attention to how you feel when you're there. Because when I was in the Anastasi uh, city, so high up like 10,000 feet up, I felt this extreme peace. I was like, man, I'm home. Like I've missed this place. And I started crying because I didn't, I didn't even understand why, but it was like, man, like if only people could see what this was, you know what I mean? And then I just had this feeling of feeling blessed that so, so long has passed and now I can still come here and see like what's happened to the world and how things have changed, how I have changed across the lifetimes not being here anymore. And it's a very beautiful experience when you treat everything as being a sacred, like every step you take is sacredness. Mm, yes. That feeling of being home. I remember being in Bali that I realized this is my soul's home. Like this, the culture, like every aspect of it just feels like me. And I also really feel that way with Hawaii though, not the commercialization of it and the way that it's been stripped from the local Hawaiians. I, I, I real that brings up a lot of triggering for me. Cause I definitely have had lifetimes as, you know, a local Hawaiian, but then there are certain places for me and even temperatures that bring up a lot of fear. So for me, the desert. I really don't like the desert. And a lot of people, they love the desert, but I did a quantum hypnosis healing technique, which is Dolores Cannon's past life regression modality that they take you to the deepest level of hypnosis. I've done two podcast episodes about this. If anyone wants to listen, if you just look up quantum hypnosis healing technique. Um, but in one of the lifetimes I went back to this lifetime in ancient Egypt and I was a, a peasant and I was just like, literally living in this like little like hut that I put together with some scraps that I found. And it was night and it was so, so cold. And I was just shivering and shivering and I was sick. And then that night I just died. I just died of freezing to death and being sick. That for me, when I'm cold, it's like, I don't have a normal reaction to it. It's like, I actually feel like I'm dying. And like Steven, my husband, he loves the AC and like typically men run hotter than women. So he's always like wanting to crank up the AC at night. And I'm like, you don't understand. I'm in pain. Like my body hurts because my body is responding as if I literally might die. And also being in a desert, I feel that like I might die here. I might just not have enough water and hydration. And also, you know, my ancestry comes from Iran and Iran is like a desert. And I'm sure there has been, I mean, I know there has been so much atrocity that has happened in my lineage. So sometimes it also comes with like facing those fears of like, I'm not going to die of 
being cold in the desert in this lifetime. I am safe in the desert, but if I don't know this, my body's going to respond. Even like the fear of, of bleeding out. That's a huge one for me. I've always been really afraid of blood needles, particularly veins, because you know, I have died from being stabbed in different lifetimes that for me, a little bit of blood, it just sends my nervous system into, holy shit, we might bleed out and die. Whereas for some people it's heights, for some people it's public speaking, for some people it's et cetera. And I think it's important for us to recognize that those fears can come from previous lifetimes because you may not have actually had a trauma in this lifetime to have caused it. But when we can understand it comes from another lifetime, then you stop beating yourself up about it and taking it as personal. And you can tell yourself it is safe for me in this lifetime to bleed. It is safe for me in this lifetime to speak. It is safe for me in this lifetime to drive in a car. And that creates such a healing to remember that what happened in the past is in the past. And we don't need to replay those fears over and over and over again. Otherwise we're actually going to recreate that same karma again in this lifetime. Absolutely. And like, you know, talking about like reprogramming your nervous system, that's how you do it. You know, like you can do it through like energy medicine, but you can also do it through like traveling and like connecting to these sacred spaces. And then kind of just not only just like creating a new narrative around it, but allowing space for you to overcome that karma, because it is ultimately whatever response is holding some level of power over you. It is your karma to overcome. And like, I need to be with a bloody person in a cold desert. Fuck. (laughs) (laughs) Happy Bernie, man. Right, right, right. But you know, like I know a lot of people who have been like, yo, you know, I used to be a witch and like speaking out of magic and stuff like that got me burned at the stake so I'm afraid to speak now like if you have that level of knowledge internally that's come to you some way you force yourself to do the opposite of what the trauma is no matter how difficult it is put yourself in that position of saying like okay I'm gonna do the opposite so I my my body can recognize that this is not going to be the same situation I oftentimes try to put myself in in like boats And I go out into like the sea and stuff like that because I died in Atlantis. I would like, I went down with the city because the king told me, you got to make sure that specific people do not get off the island. You unfortunately, you're going to have to go down with it. And some of the last memories I have is like when the city finally went down, I was floating in the depths of the water and it was getting darker and darker and darker and darker. And I'm like, wow, like I, I lived around water this whole entire time. And I never knew, I never thought that the water would take my own life. And nowadays, like, I'm like, as soon as I'm in a huge body of water, I start freaking out. I start thinking about, oh my God, where are all the things that could like a shark, like there's massive sharks that, that live in the ocean. What if it just jumps and like takes a bite out of the freaking boat? Like, you know, you start going through all these things and that's where you start meditating. You're like, you know what? <sighs> I'm not going to manifest this. Cause if I keep putting my attention on this, I will probably manifest a freaking shark showing up, you know? Mm, and I think that it's, it's so important because yeah, it's like, we can only focus on what feels good for us. And yes, it's important to have pleasure and also go into what feels good, but it's also conquering those fears. Otherwise they're going to keep, you know, having control over you. Like, you know, if you're afraid of going on a boat, think about how much you'll miss out on in your lifetime. If you're letting that fear of like jaws taking over your boat, take you. And, and then sometimes too, it's like, you go, like I went to burning man. I did not want to go, but I went and I didn't love it, you know? Cause I, I kind of went into it like, okay, I'm going to try my best. And I realized it still wasn't for me. However, it let me see, oh, I can see why people love the desert. I can see why they have fun in this, in this dimension. And it's probably just not going to be my place. I want to be in the jungle with the water. So it's important for us to have those different, those different experiences, and then also step into, okay, what actually is my highest truth? Yeah. And another thing, like while you were saying that, thinking about like the energy of the desert, like the desert itself can be a spirit guide. Like so many shamans, like especially in the Amazon, they've gone by themselves into the Amazon to learn from the Amazon. So like you can go to these, these locations and then just not even be going to like a specific thing like the Anastasia city or the great pyramids. You could just be in that element and the element will almost like resurface a lot of internal knowledge that you carry from being that element. Cause there are times where we we're not even incarnate in between 
dimensions or bodies like we, we can leave our body and there's a possibility that you probably even had a lifetime as a freaking falcon for whatever reason and like you have always been drawn to that particular animal look at what its meta metaphysical meanings are look at why you've always been drawn to water what are the metaphysical meanings of water all that is part of the greater template blueprint that is your cosmic self like you have so many details and what i like what i really like to focus on when when i do onto high is you know all that information's in front of you you just have to allow yourself to say okay i'm just not perceiving it like show me what i'm missing and the universe will literally respond and show you that stuff Mm. color alchemy too has been so massive for me of like certain days I feel so drawn to certain colors that I like wake up and I go on Pinterest and I'm like coral like I just want to see things that are coral or like lavender and it and then I'm every day I'm like I'm changing the whole furniture to coral or lavender or like whatever the color is but it's like that color has medicine for me it's that energy that my soul is craving more of so really tuning into what colors are alive for you right now which would you want to surround yourself with and you know certain like certain time periods too we do have I feel like contracts with certain colors as well that like you know you might have your deep purple couple of years or your forest green or a certain color combination and it's like that energy is soothing or enhancing your soul in some ways and we also have colors that really repel us you know, like certain colors, mm -hmm. you see it and you're like, like for me, actually, I used to love red, but now I don't actually love red. I know you love red, but I'm like okay. something about red. It's like, because in my life, maybe I'm already so like doing and, and, you know, there's a lot of red energy in, in having a business and all of that, that I'm like, I want to have more of the like softer colors, et cetera. But yeah, I, do you ever work with different colors and like meditating on those? Yeah, color therapy is huge in like alternative medicine. Um, but like one of the things that you you'll notice is that if you're drawn to specific colors, they tell you about your personality. So you can look up like gold, the meaning of gold, the color gold, right? And they'll tell you like prosperity, royalty, whatever. And you might notice that like, oh, damn, those are the things I'm always I'm always trying to manifest in my life. That's why I really like that color. Same thing happens when you look at the at a specific color that you really dislike, like maybe teal or something like that. If you look at the metaphysical meanings of that, those are the things that are deficient in your body. Those are the things that you should probably be contemplating that would then balance you out and bring you to like a better place. Like color like has been shown that if you wear it, not only does it stimulate your specific chakra, but it also like starts creating different formats of looking at life. That's why like if you if you live in a house that usually has like really muted colors, like gray or something like that, um, oftentimes it's hard for you to kind of see the positivity in reality or like to grab a lot of like creativity to create the things that you're looking for. And research has fueling, backed that too. Yeah. And if you're not fueling your, your consciousness, your unconscious mind to like be in a different state. So I usually recommend people, especially through like the laws of feng shui, like pay attention to what crystals are in what areas of your house. If feng shui will tell you like, you know, you're like the furthest portion of your house in this area should be pink. Like just attempt putting pink sheets on a specific area. Look at your body. If you're somebody who deals with a lot of like, you know, um, liver issues, you can look up the, the, the Qigong colors for liver and then notice that, okay, it's probably like a red color and you want, you'll start wearing red more often so you can get rid of that energy or you might start sleeping in that color. So you still consciously start absorbing those vibrations. A lot of times we think like energy work or like um, spirituality always has to be like a conscious effort, but you can do a lot of subconscious passive things that still help you ascend and get to the next level. Absolutely. Mm, yes. Yeah. I have been really called to like all forms of orange. Like that has been like coral peaches. I just love them. And it's, you know, the sacral chakra, it's creativity, abundance, pleasure, Lakshmi, like all of the qualities that I love and am, and am seeking more of. And then, yeah, I think for me, the red, even though red is very similar to orange, but something about the red, it like has an energy of maybe anger for me of like this, like power and intensity and aggression that it repels me. So I don't know, maybe I need more of that in my life. Who knows? But I'm like, I feel like the world is already so like red and inflamed. I want more sexy orange. Um, so yeah, that's super, super fascinating. And 
different crystals as well. Like I love citrines. And again, it has more of that creativity energy. And two, I've learned that my chalk, my aura has a lot of orange in it. So it's like, you know, I'm drawn to the color that has it. So I'd love for you to also share, how can we tune into what color our auras are? Oh, that one's real easy. Um, you can just close your eyes and you start kind of like taking deep breaths to clear yourself away from, you know, the stuff that's happened yesterday, the things that you got to do in 20 minutes. You got to like, especially you should find a, a moment where you pretty much don't have anything to do for a couple of hours. So you can feel more comfortable in your own freedom. You take a couple of deep breaths, you let go of all that stuff, those anchors, and then you just allow your mind to open. And usually what I tell my mind is like, um, my, my mind expands infinitely in all directions. And I'll just let it like say that and then actually feel it happening or imagining it happening. And usually when you open up that doorway, you'll end up seeing a specific color that shows up to you. Now that color that shows up to you um, is something that's currently in your aura and is currently something that you need to be paying attention to vitally because that's why it's making itself available to you. The darker the hint, the more kind of like tox toxic needs to be worked on. So if it's closer to a black shade, um, you need to basically like find the element that's gonna heal that. And if it's a little bit too light, almost reaching a white color, then there's it's deficient. So what it, black means overload and lighter ends up meaning like not enough. You always wanna have like a really rich, vibrant, bright color of any color that shows up to you. Mm, yeah, oftentimes when I meditate, like when I actually really drop in, I see the color purple and I thought, oh, everyone must see that because it's the, you know, the color of your third eye that just must be happening when you meditate. But I asked other friends, they're like, no, that's never happened to me. And then I learned that also purple is one of the colors of my aura. Yeah. 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 And then too, what you can do is like, I mean, they have aura cams too, that you can check out. Like you how accurate this, are those? They're super accurate, actually. Yeah, like a lot of what I've done with, because I have two different kinds of aura cams and I've, I've done tests with people where I've been like, okay, this is what I'm looking at. And let's put you through the scanner and see if that's actually what's happening. And the scanners actually pick up on it because each one of your fingers, basically in your whole entire body, your whole hand is light. You can't perceive like the different kinds of spectrums of light that are coming out of your hand, but the cameras can pick up on that and they can pick up on the luminosity and then tell you not only what color your aura is, but what body parts and stuff like that are deficient and like they need a little bit more attention. Um, if you ever checked out the gateway um, process that was really huge for a while on TikTok, I think, um, you, you can do meditations where you're imagining like a specific color, like coming into your body and feeling like even your, like you can see yourself um, in red, right? Like the, a silhouette of red and then you end up getting more vitality out of it. You can see a silhouette of green and all of a sudden you feel like your, your body's starting to breathe again. So like, there's like this really interesting thing that your aura is even responding to your thoughts. And a lot of times people think like your aura is like this fixed color, like, oh yeah, my aura is always gold, but really day to day, moment to moment, your aura will change based off of like a thought that you're carrying, the food that you're eating and like aura is essentially like uh, energy sweat. And the kind of aura that you produce on a regular basis is also working in tandem with the law of attraction, bringing in more of that energy into your reality. So people who typically have a lot of pink in their aura, those are the really loving people. And you just like, you're around them and you just can't help but like to be thankful for life and thankful for that person. I've, I've heard they're, they're very those... sensual too, like Britney Spears, Marilyn Monroe, they all have pink auras. Yeah. And those are the people that you can't help, but like almost give your attention to exactly. It's exactly what it is. So if you wanted to become more of a, of a loved person of those people that you just mentioned, you start imagining that you're always surrounded in this vibrant pink color. And all you have to do is imagine yourself doing that, stand in the mirror, draw, like take a picture of yourself, even like, and paint it with like a highlighter that your aura is that way and look at it every day and eventually your aura is going to start adapting to that and you'll start manifesting the events that come with that aura color mm. Mm. so if you can just share a couple of the other aura colors and, and what they represent so what what does a red aura represent um a red aura is usually associated to a person who um, has a lot of magnetism 
they definitely know what they want. Now there's different shades of red, obviously. So like more of a crimson red usually deals with a person who um, is, they're not necessarily uh, honest and they're more so like vicious. So you, it's not always a bad thing, but they have like this, like if you cross them the wrong way, they're definitely going to take it out on you. You know what I mean? If it's a lighter red color, then those are usually people who um, they have a passion for life. They want to have more adventure and more fun. If it's like this cherry red color, then those are usually the people who are like, they feel real sexy about themselves. Those are the people that really go out of their way to like look hot. Like Jennifer Lopez, always, is she one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jennifer Lopez, she has a lot of red. She has a lot of yellow. Um, and she also has a little bit of green. So she's super creative with that yellow. The red is that sexual, like, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm hot, right? And then like the green is because she's authentically, like she cares about the things that she's doing and the people she involves herself with. So a lot of times when you're working with these auras, you'll be able to tell, like once you get used to it too. And if you want to start seeing auras, you have to make it, uh, make a narrative in your head that says like, you've been able to see auras your entire life you just have not given the, the time of day to actually process that information um so then we go into orange orange is usually people who they want to obviously manifest um the the more vibrate of an orange the more wealthy that person tends to be um also if the orange is more on a darker side that person's carrying a lot of emotions that they they can't like you know let go of it for them is the lesson of acceptance um, if it's a lighter orange, then they're not embracing their emotions enough. Like they're usually pushing it away. Like I don't have time to like process this right now. I've got to do other things. Usually a lot of business people who are so involved in their business that they don't cater to themselves and their family have a lighter orange energy um, because, you know, they're suppressing emotions instead of actually dealing with them. Yellow is the color of creativity. Yellow has a spectrum where it can even be like this gold color. If, if the yellow is more so like this holographic -y gold, it means the person's mentality is extremely lucid and progressive. So those are the philosophers. Those are the people that you can have I a really see yellow on conversation you. with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I carry a lot of like yellow and a lot of um, orange, uh, a lot of gold as well, because of that that's just like my personality right if it's a lighter yellow then those are the people who are constantly fatigued um they're always like carrying a lot of anxiety they won't let go of the past things like that um when we go into green green is associated to your relationships and like, like how you nourish your life so the more vibrant of a green color you see on a person it means that they're healthy to some degree or they're like they're really important their focus is creating the ideal life um if it's a darker green then they're they're holding on again to a lot of like resent resentment or pains that are associated to like the relationship realm like um versus like an orange right sometimes like a darker orange involves like they people just they just get triggered very easily and they don't have a way to let go of it versus like a dark green will say like okay my mom hurt me and I haven't been able to find a way to move past this particular pain a lighter green means that that person is afraid to fall into feeling more love or feeling more of themselves and being open and trusting the world. Blue is usually associated to authenticity and truth. And that one's like, I think the most valuable if you're like an energy healer or you're, you have a lot of liars or something like that in your life, pay attention to the blue that kind of like comes to you. You might see it on them. You might see it in your mind's eye, or you might even just feel it. Sometimes I can't even, I can't always see somebody's aura. I just hear it's a super dark blue, like a super dark blue, almost navy black color. And I'll be like, okay, well, that means that this person's obviously not, not very honest. or so they're not at least in this moment right now, not telling me the truth. If it's a more bright, vibrant, almost like a neon blue color, that person is hella honest. Their authenticity is like through the roof. Like those are the types of people you really want to vibe with. People who have a lighter, um, like blue color those are the people who don't speak up for themselves they don't really always say what's on their mind because they're afraid of what other people are going to be thinking so when we go into purple purple at a neutral like indigo purpley color that one's a psychic person the more vibrant of a psychic color that is like a, a vibrant purple that person's more in tune with a specific kind of intuition now intuition kind of like changes by person some people are like third eye intuitive some people are just like environmentally intuitive. They just can really feel the energies around themselves. But that that high vibrancy purple will give you an indication of that. A dark purple means the person has basically shut themselves off 
from the intuitive side, usually based off of fear. Like they're afraid that if they go into their intuition, then they'll run into like a, a negative being that's going to cause them a lot of harm. Um, a very light purple is usually people who are, don't believe in like the psychic realm or like their own ability to be psychic, which we all are. Um, and then we come to the crown chakra essentially, which, which the crown chakra is usually describing to you um, rather two different spectrums. It's going to be like this raspberry color. If it's a raspberry color, this person's really in the moment they're really in love even they want more of whatever they're experiencing at this current time if it's a white color then that person is more so seeking enlightenment versus being more so in the moment so neither one of those colors is bad it's just more so based off of the person if you don't see a color that resonates with the crown chakra then that's that's where you kind of be you got to be like okay like how do I help this person because their crown chakra is somewhat like really low None of your chakras can actually be fully shut off, um, but they can be, you know, running at 1% versus running at 100. Um, the remaining colors that associate themselves with are like, if you see black or gold, that's your halo. You're basically your eighth chakra, your shamanic chakra. People who have a lot of black are people who are carrying a lot of trauma from other past lifetimes. Um, they carry a lot of hatred, stagnation, worry, stuff like that. Um, if you see the opposite spectrum, which is gold, then that color is telling you that that person's transformative. They're willing to like um, think about transcendence. They're always kind of like contemplating more than what the material universe is giving you. If you see high vibrant, like ultraviolet, then that's the soul. Um, usually people who are living their dharma um, or they're really in, a, in tune with like their soul purpose or their soul like um, origins, because it's not always about dharma, but it's sometimes about like just like I know I come from this one galaxy or whatever. Their aura is super ultraviolet purple. And it shows you that that person has transcended time and space altogether. Those are like gems in this reality. Um, there's like this vibrant uh, blend of browns and like earthy tones, which will then show you that that person is very nature oriented. They can talk, usually those people talk to animals um, telepathically. They just channel freaking plant medicine instantaneously. Like they're, they have a cold and they're like, I don't know why, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buy myself some nettle. And they don't, they, it works for them, right? Because they're like very much so in tune with that. If you have a super splendor, like luminescent energy that's constantly changing colors in some way, shape or form. It kind of looks like glitter a lot of times. That person's super, super in tune with their spirit. That's usually more so like um, like people like us, they usually have like kind of, they've you've been working in spirituality or you've been working on like understanding some portion of the cosmos extensively from spirit level. And then if you end up seeing finally like a, a copper color, those are the people that are very in tune with the Akashic records. They're in tune with the cosmos. So those are the people that, you know, they may not always watch like what cosmic weather is happening or something like that, but they'll be hit and they'll be like, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like something's happening in deep space. I feel so sick right now. And then all of a sudden you start seeing like the rest of the world is responding to like what they're picking up on because they are cosmic beings like their essence is more so rooted in deep space than it is in the physical material universe um again like your your auras are gonna are gonna change between these spectrums at different states in your life and different things that you're focusing on but that's pretty much the gist of how you can pick up on these specific colors and what they mean Wow. So good. I recommend people just go back and like pause between each one, write it down. Um, and there's so much we should do another episode just about aura. So what, what aura colors do you see in me right now? Um, today you definitely have a lot of yellow, um, uh, which it's like a high vibrant yellow, you know, you're just like thinking about things, being creative. Um, you have a little bit of blue there because obviously we're talking, right? Like it's like authenticity. You have a bit of purple on the outside, which is like, because we're right now kind of like channeling the cosmos so that's like kind of like right in there and you also have that glittery color that I told you about that luminescence on the outer layer as well which is spirit like you're just channeling I would say joy obviously right like you're channeling this pleasure of doing what you're doing and that's coming from spirit level for sure Mm, love that so much. So cool. Well, thank you so much for all of your wisdom today. This truly yeah. was a masterclass of all things, past lives, spirit guides, astrocartography, auras, 
so many different realms. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. And where can listeners connect with you further? Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Um, definitely check out my website, antahai.us. If you ever want to check out some of my classes that I go into a bunch of different types of shamanism and energy work, or just follow me on Instagram at antahai and you'll be able to find me anywhere, really. If you just type in antahai on even YouTube or TikTok, you'll find me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you.